specific past, women were keepers of mana, revered as gods, holders of the highest titles. Today, Pacific women have made more strides than ever before in their societies. In terms of economic development, they've increased their presence in the paid workforce and developed innovative projects in face of the increasingly westernized commercial environment. Maybe in two months, we're going to harvest that one, and then we're going to have some, uh, some honey from them and try and sell them to the locals home. And we have some money from them. Despite new initiatives and the significance women have in traditional roles, the struggle for pay equity in most occupations is ongoing. Women continue to be marginalised in lower levels of employment, education and political status. And rigid attitudes to gender roles are embedded deeply in Pacific cultures. The first challenge is souvenism. Mm, very difficult uh, for uh, some bombastity, uh, you know, attitude uh, from some of the figures in the village and especially and even worse when it comes from my own connection. Um, uh, we hold a different matai but we are related in blood or some sort. They, uh, they hate to feel that uh, I am brighter than them, that any bright idea will come from me. And uh, at the same time, they always look at the physical power. But to me, my physical power or my physical strength is in me, not out of me. So that's my first challenge. But my reply is peace and uh, patience. We've heard a lot of uh, criticisms being levelled at, uh, at the fact that we only have a few women in Parliament. And of course, that's true. Uh, and I think right now the women in Samoa are, are grappling with the dynamics of what to do in terms of, 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 of doing that, if that's the required indicator for progress. But in Samoa's history, the status of women was paramount and one of Samoa's most revered gods of all was female, Nafanua. Born of a blood clot and buried in the ground, this ancient deity rose from the underworld Pulotsu upon hearing the cries of the chief of Falealupo, lamenting the cruel enslavement of the warriors of the western region of Savai. Nafanua led the district of Falealupo into battle to free the warriors, victorious with the power of her war clubs gifted from the king of Pulotsu. On the hill of her greatest battle site, Fale Lima, the wind blew up the leaves of her tiputa, exposing her breasts and revealing to her vanquished enemies that they'd been defeated by a woman. Nafanua was because she was uh, always associated with victory that became the war goddess of Samoa. There's a symbolism there as well, apart from the fact that um the fact that this woman, this woman warrior came out, grew out of a clot of blood, I'm sure has some symbolism in terms of the nurturing role of, of women. I'm quite sure Nafanua was a human being like us. She must have been motivated and asked the gods, you know, to please help me. This is my mission, to crush the, the cruelty, which she did, she did. But not only, a, you know, she raised the army, and uh, say, follow me. And you see, it was very simple. Her army was not strong, but just because uh, the other people she saw, they saw that was uh, when the kipuka, when her uh, top flew over the wind and they saw, no, 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 she's no, no man, there's, there's a woman. That was enough to really send the, you know, the, the, the word around, oh, no, 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 we are not fighting with a human being. Every time there's a major political, social upheaval in Samoa, the name of Nafanua is mentioned. During wars, has to be sanctioned by Nafanua. Whenever there's a change or something, Nafanua name is there. Women were very, very important, and they were considered to be, to be leaders, and could be as brawny and as as brave as any man, and and, and as 
as any worry that existed. And so that's why we had somebody, a mythological figure such as Nafanua. The four highest titles in all Samoa traced through female ancestral connections once came under the rule and authority of another woman descended from the Nafanua line. Salama Sina in the 15th century was the holder of all the four Te Whaiwha titles. Her reign marked a significant period in Samoa's history, establishing 60 years of peace and a new sense of social order. Most significant were the bloodlines that Salama Sina embodied. Her succession to the holder of the four paramount titles in Samoa was the result of complex manoeuvring behind the throne even before her birth. Salama Sina's adoptive grandmother Soe Malelangi put into place the first mechanisms to make Salama Sina tupu or Samoa, the ruler of all Samoa. I'm quite sure, you know, one day she suddenly saw, this is it. This is the girl who can bring Samoa together. And uh, not only that she acquire and she maneuver, a lot was done behind the line, maneuver people to give her daughter the, remember what was it, Tuya, I know Tuya too. There was one um, district who came to offer her the title, but they said, Leai, give it to my granddaughter. Because those people didn't realize that she was had, she had vision, she had uh, started planning, and then uh, she even remarried, married another, yeah, that tour, the Tuya tour, so that the title could uh, be brought to uh, the Salamasina as the first Tafaifa. And if you look at it, that was not only the first Tafaifa, but the first effective reign. Salamasina's mother, Vaituifanga one of the ten wives of the chief Tuya Anna Tamalilangi was a royal descendant of the Tuitonga. A child from this union would be a threat to all the other wives and their families. So when she fell pregnant, Vaiatuefanga sought refuge with her Tongan supporters in the village of Nofoali'i, where today this whale stands in her honour. Now the reason why this residence is named the Afiafi of Vaiatuefanga is that when she conceived this caused ripples because every, all the other ten marriages were eyeing the top slot. But because of the credentials, the genealogical credentials, everybody expected that if she, if she were to bore a child, then in all likelihood she would succeed. And seeing, you know, the menace on the frets in looks and behavior, she ran off at night and came to where her family were. I think she was important because she united Upolu, this island, and Savai in one person, so to speak. And I think she also perhaps united Samoa as a people and Tonga. Uh, connect the, the royal lineages of, of two societies. In eastern Polynesia, there were many significant female lines of leadership. In Rarotonga in the 1880s, women had taken on most of the powerful ariki titles. When the church came in, it, it changed to a, a woman. Uh, in fact, all of the ariki started to become women. But the pastors they were on the island, gave the uh, impression to the uh, men that a higher calling was the church. And so they encouraged the men to go on missions. And many Royal Tongans served mission in, in, in various parts of Melanesia. And some of, some of them were, were sons of, of chiefs, and they died uh, overseas, some of them. And so women started to hold those titles. Someone suggested that uh, the missionaries found it easier to work with women than with men. So they preferred to have the women hold the titles. One of the most influential ariki was the Makea Tekau in 1843. Her meteoric rise to power was largely due to the selling of her land in Avarua to the church. 
and her handy position to Avarua Harbour. The church became headquartered in Avarua on Makea land, made Makea important. Well, a lot of it was force of circumstances. One, the missionary supported her. Two, she lived in the right place, the right island, Raratonga. Her um, palace that she built later is quite close to the two harbours where overseas whalers, British, British warships would come anchor outside and she would be met by the captains and so on. She'd entertain them and, uh, of course, they built up this picture of a, a queen, which we never had, which is totally the wrong word to call a high chief ariki. Makea's power as an ariki and first governor of Rarotonga took a major turn when France's armed takeover of Tahiti posed an imminent threat of invasion to Rarotonga. In 1888, Makea Tako resorted to seeking help from the British to set up a protectorate of Rarotonga, despite her suspicions of their colonial power. When they decided that uh, they preferred to be British rather than French, because the French were going around claiming various islands, there were rumours they were on their way to Rarotonga, and the uh, English residents on the island, Nicholas family and, and so on, were trying to urge Maketa Cole to fly the British flag. She was still distrustful, so uh, she was a little suspicious about the whole thing. So she allowed the flag to be pulled to, to the mast, but not unfurled until they saw the, uh, the, the French boat, then they unfilled the flag. So that was the second part of her power source. The first one was really the, uh, the Christian link. And then between the, the church, her link with the church and her link with the colonial, uh, new colonial system, she became important. Once the uh, British protectorate sent their bureaucrats over here, power then began to shift to them and they would dictate to her and the records uh, show that she knew what they were trying to do but she was powerless to stop it. Things were now changing, people were going, become diverted to the, the new uh, political, you know, masters and uh, she too tried to, uh, to interfere or to stop certain things from taking place. And uh, of course, it was, she had given the power to the Brits. In the same late 19th century period, the inhabitants of another island kingdom, Hawaii, also lived under the rule of a woman. Queen Liliokelani was the last reigning monarch of the Hawaiian Islands. She fought to introduce a new Hawaiian constitution to help to empower the indigenous population against growing American business interests, wanting to annex the islands for the economic power of the sugar industries. In the wake of an indigenous uprising, Queen Liliokalani was arrested and found guilty of having knowledge of concealed weapons on her property. Under the threat of mass bloodshed, she had no alternative but to surrender the administration of Hawaii to a group of businessmen who promptly formed a provisional government. Queen Liliokalani was imprisoned at Iolani Palace until 1896. She refused to have bloodshed for her throne, you know. Um, whereas, you know, if you put a man in the same position, his throne's being, um, he's being overthrown and um, uh, an invading force is coming in, a man would probably go, we will fight to the death, you know? But for Queen Lili Uokalani, it was, no, it, my, it's life that's important. This queen who abdicated the throne for the safety of her people symbolizes for many the loss of rights of an independent nation. 
1895, the provisional government became the Republic of Hawaii and was eventually annexed to the United States, under whose constitution it remains today, in a world far removed from Queen Liliokelani's vision of indigenous sovereignty. In 1900, Hawaii was annexed. We became citizens whether we wanted to or not. No one asked us, there was no referendum, no discussion, nothing. So I am a citizen, I do have a passport, but as far as human rights are concerned, I was never asked whether I wanted to be a citizen or whether the United States had any right to make me a citizen or to be here. Hawaii may remain in the throes of the Queen's struggle for indigenous rights, but her voice echoes in the youth population of the country. Today, the Children's Trust that she set up is one of the largest child welfare agencies in the country, benefiting around 2,000 ethnic Hawaiian children as the legacy of Queen Liliokelani lives on in future generations.